Get hold of your Bible. Did you bring a Bible to church? You must be new. Got a Bible? Hold up your Bible. I'm going to love seeing this picture. Somebody got a camera. Take a picture of this. Everybody hold your Bible up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold up your phone if it's your Bible. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> hey, look at phone guy right here. All right. That's awesome. That's awesome. And now you can even, hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. Now you can even take notes on your, I, can't, I used to hammer phone Bibles and stuff because you couldn't take notes on them. Look at all you iPad Bibles. Ooh, got an iPad. Ooh. Everyone say that. Say, ooh, got an iPad. Got an iPad. Ooh. All right, take your Bible down. Get it open to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. And uh, title of this message is, I've hinted at this already. Now we're going to do the full thing. Uh, what to do in a time of drought. What to do in a time of drought. The key question this morning is, say it. Yeah, I got to give high marks to the first four rows, very low marks to the rest of the room. All right? So um, uh, the title of the message today is... Okay, everybody who's behind the cameras, say it. Go ahead. You're here. You are here. That is great. All right, that's what we're going to be talking about. Let me read, and no apology for this at all. Let me read 16 verses in God's Word, okay? Everyone follow. Let's give attention. This is the Word of God. And by the way, these are not random stories. Did you know that the New Testament says that the things that were happening to them were happening as examples to us? Okay, so this, this, is, we're, this is for us. For, this is all about guiding us. That's why this happened, so that we could learn from it. And here's the story. Now, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, Ahab was evil king, evil, evil king. His wife's name was, say it. Nice, nice that you know that. I had to study that, but I know now. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives before, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew uh, nor rain, so complete desert, drought, See, they were, they were wicked, and God was calling them to repent. And one of the reasons why God brings a drought is because he doesn't like where we're at. One of the reasons why God brings a time of poverty into our life, because he wants us to get to a different place. We want to say that the problems are out here, but the thing that God most wants to address, point to what God wants, most wants to address. God wants to deal with some stuff in here. And I've had to deal with some stuff in here. I, I've said this before. I'm not even the same person I was when, when we started Harvest and Niles. God's been working on me. God's been working on Kathy and I. He's been changing us and growing us. Where well, I'm so glad to have Pastor Rick and Lynn here today. We don't get with them that often, though they're our treasured partners. God's been working on Rick and Lynn. They're not the same people that they were when we started Harvest and Niles. I'm so thankful for Mo and Susan and the leadership they give here. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, 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 amen. Amen. And, and Mo, Mo, Mo and Susan, she's still as beautiful as she's always been. Mo actually has a Samson thing going now. He's, see how he's growing his hair? Mo's growing his hair. And, and if you sense a little resentment in me over that, you're, you're, you're hearing that right. And I just want to say that Mo has made a public pledge that he will not cut his hair until a new worship center is built on this campus. Okay? So... So just kind of just kind of picture Susan with glasses and that's where Mo's going, all right? Now, <laughs> where was I? All right. As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. I was making the point that we've all suffered things. We've all been through trials. And you know what one of the main reasons God allows difficult circumstances in our life is to change us. Another reason is so he can do more through us. John chapter 15 says, he that bears fruit, he prunes that he may bear more fruit. And I want to publicly announce this morning that a season of extended trials has come to an end and a season of expanded fruitfulness is in front of us as a church. And I'm very excited about that. I'm, it's, it's why we endure. It's why we endure to get to the next season of fruitfulness. So God was bringing trials on these people, and it came in the form of no rain for three years except by my word, said Elijah. Whew. The word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn east and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. Yeah, you better hide after you tell them no rain. I mean, they didn't have uh, Lake Michigan. They didn't, they didn't have, uh, 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 you know, running water. They didn't have some of the things that we have. You're like, oh, no bottled water? For no, no, it's way worse than that, okay? 
Uh, millions of people would die because of this pronouncement or uh, appropriate to the population of that day. And so he said, you better go hide, man. And he went east of the Jordan, verse 4. You shall drink from the brook. And I have, because drought, we're we going to drink. Drink from the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I remember my mom telling this story in Bible club with little flannel graphs, and, and here's the guy sitting there, and these birds are coming. Sweet thing, right? And I had a bird in the sermon last week. <laughs> that wouldn't have been the kind that would be bringing food, though. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the, see the drought, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Now what? Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there, and she was, ga notice, she was gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, I want you to imagine a place where people have, it's a drought, they have nothing, okay? If I were to say to you, could you, could, you, could, you, could you get me a cup of water? You could do that, right? But that's not what this is. You have to see the context, what he's asking. He's asking for what does not exist. The whole river he was drinking from has what? So now he goes to this place and he's like, could, could you um, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink? And as she was going to, so she's like, fine, fine. As she was going to bring it, he called her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. It's like, I'm going to push, you push, you're pushing it now. <laughs> and she said, as the Lord your God lives. Now, this is a lot of faith. She didn't say the Lord, what? She didn't say the Lord my God. She said the Lord your God. We it would be hard to make a case that this lady was a converted true follower of the one true God, Yahweh. It would be hard to make that case. I don't, she's, she, but it, real interesting how much faith she shows. As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm down to the end here. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. I was preaching somewhere this week out of state, a long way away, and I said to the people there, how many people believe this actually happened? And like five hands went up. But I'm at harvest now. <laughs> Say welcome home. <laughs> how many people believe this actually happened? All right, so uh, ladies, mothers, and fathers, family, um, let's just take a moment and imagine the feelings associated with that sentence. We're in a drought here, Elijah. You're asking for my last meal. I've seen my resources go down, down, down. You caught me at the end. We're going to starve to death, and you're asking for our last meal. I've already resigned myself to the fact that me and my son are both, I'm gonna have to watch my son die. I'm gonna starve too. Yeah, not the greatest time to show up with a request. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, do not fear. Paul, I wish I could just uh, take hold of every one of you right now and just speak that into your life. Do not fear. You say, James, I've been looking up ahead. I, I, I don't know where all this is going. We're, things are tough and, 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 and we're, out of some, we're out of work. It's, it's really a tough time at home right now. I, I don't know where my life's going. I don't even, some of you, I don't even know who I'm going to be with. It's rough right now. Do not fear. Do not fear. 
Fear's not taking you anywhere good. The New Testament says that God has not given you a spirit of fear. Uh, the New Testament says that the spirit has been sent into your heart to drive out fear and instead replace fear with this, Abba, Father. You have a father who loves you. You have nothing to fear. In God, you have nothing to fear. Isn't that good news? Just turn to your neighbor and say that lovingly. Say, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. That's a big deal. So he says to her, do not fear. Go as, and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it. <laughs> it's just an, it's outrageous. You have nothing to fear. Go and do as you said. Which part? The cake part? The, the die part? <laughs> well, fine. Go eat and die. Just make me some first. <laughs> Prophets are not always as sensitive pastorally. <laughs> Everyone say, Mo would never do that. Say it. <laughs> Mo would never do that. Wow. There's some principle here, though. First make me a little cake of it, bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says, here it is. Here's why, here's why. Now you've got to finish the sentence. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. Here's why you should go do that. Because here's what God says. The jar of flour shall not be spent. Hey, you're not going to run out. God says you're not going to run out. You might have to do it less. You might have to stretch it further. You might have to find a way. But here's what I'm telling you. No one in my, God says, no one in my family is going to go hungry. No one in my family is going to go without. No one in my family is going to starve. Here's what the Lord God of Israel says. The jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty. Awesome. How long is that going to last? Until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So she heard from the Lord. How important was this person? Not very. Just, just a messenger. A message from the king. You're not going to run out. She went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. Underline this in your Bible and in your neighbor's Bible if they're stubborn. <laughs> Doesn't matter if they scribble. That's what they get for not doing it. Verse 16, the jar of flour was not spent. Everyone say not spent. Neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. They were in a time of drought. Let me just describe, I want you to know that I'm not oblivious to what's going on in our, uh, in fact, the reason I'm here is because of what's going on uh, in our economy, in our country, in our day. I'm not living in 1997. I'm not living in 1986. I'm not living in 2005. I'm right here in 2011. I know what's going on, okay? I'm paying attention. And as I seek with our pastors and with our elders to give leadership to our church, I want to just go over with you now five characteristics of a drought, and I want you to know that we get it. At the end of this little section, all right, I want you in your heart to be like, wow, they really do get it. All right, so here's the first thing. Five things in a time of drought. First of all, diminished resource. We just flat out don't have what we used to have, all right? We used to have this much extra at the end of have to, tithe, mortgage or rent, food, clothing, necessity. We used to have this much at the end of that. Now we have this much at the end of that. Now we have this much at the end of that. Now we don't even have enough for that, okay? I get that. One of the things that happens in a drought, <laughs> one of the things that happens in a drought is that church bells ring. <laughs> uh, note to self, the new worship center here in Niles will have to have windows that close. <laughs> Running through my mind, just how uh, long do these bells ring? <laughs> It could be a trick, though. Wait. Okay, I think we're good. In a time of drought, thank you for your warm sense of humor. You're just blessed. That can't be true. That can't be true. 
Ja, 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 ja. That's crazy. How long does this go on, Mo? Now, I believe in respecting other churches, but this seems to be an attack to me. <laughs> How many police officers do we have here? <laughs> Hands up, police. Look at them all. All right. Didn't I say that it might not be done? Didn't I say that? Oh my gosh. All right. Am I safe? Yeah, that must have been the 11 o'clock scheme, right? So I got till 12? <laughs> all right, all right. So in a time of drought is diminished resource. I get that. Everyone say you get that. I get it. I really do. I, I get it. Uh, second thing, damaged confidence. Like your confidence gets damaged. I mean, we were making decisions. I, I, my wife and I, but we bought that couch because things were going great. We don't buy nothing now. I mean, just read every economic report. People are holding back. And, and that's part of, of course, what makes the economy struggle. And, and in some ways, we need to hold back if we're buying things we can't afford in the first place. Well, I'll just figure it out later. But the bonus might not come and the job might not last and the income might not grow. And, and I, really, I really, really do get all that. So uh, diminished... Um, resource and damaged confidence and people just like we're just not just sure we're just not sure and that leads to this third thing doubtful future i have to see the future clearly i was going to work this many years i was going to take this kind of retirement we were going to do these things and and now when we look at the future we just don't know how many people had a clear sense of their future and their career and their retirement and don't have that clarity today put up your hand if you don't have that like you had it all right i get that i get it and, and I really do. And other people who did retire now are, are facing, I might have to return to the workforce. I just don't know how all this is going to sort itself out. Doubtful future. Two more things. Uh, deficit living. Some people in our church are facing deficit living. I was with a man this week that I really respect, faithful man in our church for many, many, many years. He said, James, he says, I'm so thankful for the teaching I've had through the years on finances at Harvest because we paid off our mortgage and we... Um, we, we were faithful to the Lord in our tithes, and, and I mean, our company told us, you could just forget about those kind of incomes from the past. That's never happening anymore. No more. That's, that is a thing of the past. Have the funeral. That's over. He said, we had to go and uh, borrow some money against our house, thankfully, that we paid off. I said, well, that's your money. I said, you just pray the Lord will give you wisdom in that, but... Um, uh, deficit living, a lot of people are facing that. We're needing to spend more than the income that's coming in right now. And then, of course, all of that uh, diminished resource, damaged confidence, doubtful future, deficit living leads to this last thing, a real desert mentality. We don't live in a desert, okay? Um, but people who live in the desert have a very different perspective about how much water you can drink and how much you use uh, to take a shower with. And, and, and you, just, you just, I mean, you think about water. Everything in our life shouts there's no scarcity of water, Right? And we, they turn, there's no turn that tap off or tighten that down, it's dripping. Or, or, but when you live in a desert, you get real careful, real fast with absolutely every resource. And, 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 but here's the problem, okay? A desert mentality is uh, not what made America the greatest country on earth. And a desert mentality is not going to lead us forward, not as a country, uh, not as a church, not as individual families. Um, that sort of hoard and save and hide and it's just, it's just not the way things really work. So you say, well, James, you told me the message is about what to do in a time of drought. Here it is. Now with all that as a background, I just wanted you to have a sense that I understand the faces that I'm looking into. Here's what you do in a time of drought and I hope you'll see each of these things uh, from the text. Again, there are five of these and here's the first thing you, you need to do. You need to embrace God's sovereignty, okay? You just need to, in a fresh way, um, this drought, you see it in the text that I just read? Where did the, who, point to who the drought came from. The drought came from God. God was the one. God is in charge of the universe. God is ruling over everything. God has allowed, how many people believe that God could have prevented this current economic crisis if he wanted to? 
all right? But God has allowed that this economic crisis, which is the equivalent of a drought in New Testament times, God has ordained that this would come at this time. All right? And I pray and hope, and I believe there's many people coming into our church, many people coming to know Christ, and one of the reasons why that's happening is, is because their resources aren't making it anymore. And, and the, this might be, a, this not might be, this is a very tough time economically, but this is an awesome day for the church of Christ. Do you understand that? People, amen, amen. People are looking in other places. People are looking in other places. People are in search of other resources, and people are seeking out what they would not have sought out if God had not allowed this time of drought. And so we as the church, we as the followers of Christ, need to embrace God's sovereignty. If you're writing things down, just write this down. Say, God is in control of my life. God is in control of my life. God is in control of the economy. God is in control of how these realities are impacting my family. God is in control of all of this. And when we say that God is in control, what are we really saying? We're saying, I'm not across a canyon and God's on the other side like he's abandoned me. No, no, as we often say here at Harvest, far from abandoning us when tough times come, God's rolling up his sleeves. God's moving toward us. God's getting ready to show us some things and do some things, just like in the passage we just read. How many people have faith to believe that you could see God do some amazing things yet this year in your life? All right, amen? We, God could still do that this year in our life. He, he may be moving toward us with something incredible. And I surely believe he's doing that for us as a church. So that's the first thing, embrace God's sovereignty. Now the next two things I wanna share is what I need to do and then what you need to do, okay? Just as straightforward as I can make this, okay? Sometimes people walk away from church going, I didn't like that, but nobody leaves Harvest going, what was he talking about, okay? <laughs> so clarity, right? Clarity. Here, here's what I need to do. I need to enlist people of faith. That's a, this is a drought. We're in a drought. Everyone say we're in a drought. drought. We're in a drought. And, and I got to lead our church. And, and when I say me, I mean us, okay? I mean me and, and, and Mo and Rick and, and our elders, Jim Rowan and, and uh, uh, Marcel Olar here on this campus and all of our elders and all of our pastors across the life of this church, okay? Uh, we... And, and I'm trying to give leadership to this, but it's us, okay? We need to enlist people of faith, okay? I'm here this morning looking for some people who want to take some faith steps with God in a drought. Now, this drought could be over in, in a year or two years, and we'll look back on this season, and some people will come out of this just like they went into it, and other people are gonna come out of this with some lessons learned that are gonna change their life forever, okay? And, and so here's the, here's the question. I'm here today to enlist people of faith. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like one of those, how many, people are, how many people here served in the military? Put up your hand if you served in the military. Thank God for you and every one of your hands that went up. And did you have to go to an, enl amen, amen. Amen. Did you have to go to an enlistment person? Did you have to sign up? Did you do that? Yeah, yeah. So that's me today. I'm that guy, all right? I'm, I'm the enlistment, what do you call the guy? What do you call the guy? Recruiter, that's me, all right? And, and uh, I'm looking to enlist people who want to grow in faith. Just a, a little bit of review here. Faith is important. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six. all right? Faith is what uh, God gives you so you can receive everything else that God wants to give you. Jesus said, whatever you ask in faith, believe that you have received it and it will be done for you. Now that's an awesome assertion. Believe that you have received it. Some of you are here today, you need more income. You need a, a, a greater, uh, a, a better job. You need a job, period. You need a provision in your family, something that's more important even than resources, by far. Kathy and I have been through trials where we would have given up everything we ever have and everything we'd ever make for the rest of our life to see some of the answers to prayer that we have seen, all right, that we have seen in our own family, in our, own, in our lives, in my health, and, and uh, just got some good uh, test results from the doctor again this week. And that kind of l lingers in the back of my mind all the time. Amen. And, and uh, here's the thing, all right? Faith, faith. I'm enlisting people of faith. Let's review our definition. Faith is believing the word of God. Okay? Believing it. I believe this. It's believing the word of God. And here's the key. Acting upon it. Got to take some action. 
Thank God Jim and Linda Rowan believed God and took some action in regard to this struggling little church. Thank God that we believed the word of God and took some action in a time when we were overwhelmed. We really didn't have the, the time or the energy to do, to do an extra thing, but we believe God wanted us to do it, and we stepped out, and I'm glad we did. Anyone glad we did? Yeah. Right? I'm glad we did. And so uh, believing the word of God and acting upon it, now this is key no matter how I feel. I never feel like faith. <laughs> I always feel like doubt. Anybody here feel like doubt? One honest Christian in the group. I love you so much right now. You're the one. The rest of you bunch of liars here today. Okay, okay. How many people here ever feel like doubt? Right? Doubt comes easily, all right? Doubt comes easily. Doubt comes easily when surrounded by doubters. That's why we come to church to get around some people of faith so we can believe God about some things. Faith is believing the word of God and acting upon it no matter how I feel. No matter how I feel. Why, why? Do you know? Good, thank you. Because God promises a good result. Nobody ever, I've never, I've had, I've, trust me, we, we, we get complaints from time to time and, and I've never had one person ever come up to me in the 23 history of Harvest and say, I regret trusting God. I regret it, and I'm mad that you pushed me into it. That's never happened, okay? Always people are like, I wish I'd trust God more. I wish I'd trusted God sooner. I wish I'd trusted God better. I wish I'd trusted God more completely. And so that's why I'm here. Embrace God's sovereignty. I'm here to enlist people of faith. Now, um, here's why you're here, okay? In this passage of Scripture, the whole thing turns on the woman, if the woman did not endorse the man of God, nothing else would have happened. What if he had said to her, go get me a lunch and da 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 because this is what the Lord God says. And she said, I want God says, I want what you say. And I'm not doing that. You, you can come watch us die if you want, but I'm not doing what you said. The whole thing goes down if the woman doesn't endorse the man of God. Now I've said this already. I'm, uh, we have representative leadership at Harvest, okay? Right now, I represent all the pastors and all the elders of the church. I'm up here talking, but I met in a room this morning, went over my message with Mo, went over my message with Pastor Rick, went over my message with some of the leaders in the church. So I'm the mouthpiece for what we are, eh, right? What we're leading our church to do, but, but so what, here's what you need to decide, like the woman needed to decide. Do you believe that God speaks through the leaders in our church. Has Harvest, answer it personally, because I, I, I'm not trying to get some big rally going here. Each person's gonna have to decide for themselves, for you and for your family. Do you believe that God speaks through the leadership of our church? Has Harvest become for you a trusted source of spiritual nourishment? Now, look, at nobody uh, is uh, perfect, but do you believe uh, that when I stand up and say, uh, God has led us in this time of drought, not to roll back into some desert mentality, but to step forward as a church and to take some faith steps that we probably couldn't take at any other time. When I stand up and say that, do you think to yourself, well, that's what you say. Or have we, by God's grace, everyone say, by God's grace, or have we, me representing us, have we by God's grace earned the credibility to say to you that God is leading our church to take some steps of faith at the hardest possible time to take some steps of faith so that we can learn some things that we could learn at any other time? What do you believe about that? All right? That's what it's going to come down to. Okay, And I can show up all I want to enlist people of faith, but if you're not willing to endorse the message that you're hearing and say, I trust God in this. I, I trust Pastor James in this. I trust Mo in this. I, I've come to see that, that God speaks through them. See, if the lady had been like, who are you? Who are you to tell me that? Who are you to give me? See, that's really what it's gonna come down to. So I'm here to enlist people of faith what to do in a time of drought. Embrace God's sovereignty, enlist people of faith, endorse God's messenger. 
Here it is, fourthly. Expand your faith. This is a time to expand your faith. How many people, and it's good to be honest at church. How many people could say, James, I'm going to tell you the way it really is. We're in a tougher space financially than I can remember ever. Put up your hand if that's you. All right? Awesome. Honestly, put it up high. That's, that's us. That's where we're at right now. That's fantastic that you can say that and be honest. And so I'm here because I love you, and I'm like, what do you do then? Okay? Well, um, what I believe with all of my heart is, is that you need to embrace God's sovereignty, and you need to enlist people of faith. That's what I'm doing. You need to endorse God's messenger. That's what I'm asking you to do. You need to expand your faith. All right? You need to expand your faith. 